welcome to the Sword and Laser. I'm Veronica Belmont. And I'm Tom Merritt. Welcome back to the old space castle. It's the old pub in the sky. Yeah, flying pub. The boozy ship the of the stars. Good thing dragons are flying it, not good us. Good thing. Because he's sober. Yeah. Yeah, he's For a very difficult, like difficult story years. to talk about that. Yeah. I know. Yeah, it's very special. We'll get to that. Uh, so this is our series of author spotlights <laughs> where we introduce you to an author, their history, their work, and of course, ask them your questions as well as ours. And uh, we like to start off by telling you things you should know. So here are eight things you should know about Chuck Wendig. Chuck Wendig is unapologetically a cursor. He says he uses a lot of naughty language, and it's probably NSFL, not safe for life. Tor, the publisher, described his writing as, quote, dark and foul-mouthed and not afraid to go there and then some. He describes one character as a dark little sparrow on stumpy legs, a human gallstone, a bitter apple seed, a black cancer shadow on a CT scan. I don't want to be that person. Chuck claimed once to have been born without a face or hands, which we're pretty sure is an exaggeration, but he did get his start writing role-playing games, which he claims taught him work ethic. We don't know if that's an exaggeration or not, but he sure writes a damn lot. He's also a screenwriter. Chuck's book, Under the Empyrean Sky, is the first known example of the corn punk genre. Chuck has written a non-fiction guide for aspiring authors called The Kick-Ass Writer, 1001 Ways to Write Great Fiction, Get Published, and Earn Your Audience, which ranges from writing craft like character creation and scene construction to promotional techniques for blogging, social media, and crowdfunding. Chuck's infographic explains the secret to writing, does not include drinking unicorn blood, but mm. does involve writing as much as you can, as fast as you can, finishing it, hitting deadlines, and trying very hard not to suck. Chuck used Kickstarter to fund his book Bait Dog in March 2012 and got more than twice his goal. We're pretty certain he didn't spend it all on bourbon because he put out the novels. He also appears to like tacos. Yeah, definitely, definitely a recurring theme. Uh, Chuck's most recent novel is The Cormorant, which came out December 29th, 2013. The story is the third in a series and involves a psychic assassin battling fate who is headed to Florida. As we all are eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, now you know the basics. Uh, but what makes Chuck Wendig tick? Let's get a little more insight from Aaron in the whiteboard. Chuck Wendig is a righteous dude. Not because of his Blackbird series, which reads like an updated extrapolation of Stephen King's classic The Dead Zone. Not because of his mastery of the dark thriller, laced with comedy so black that in one critic's words, the Grim Reaper would laugh at it. No, here's why I would follow this man into hell. Hunter the Vigil. That's right. Chuck Wendig is point man for the team that remembered the essential truth about the undead bloodsuckers infesting our RPGs, our sci-fi cons, and the very fabric of this great nation. Vampires, sparkly or not, deserve a boot to the head. As a bonus, Wendig is the living master of one of the great frontiers of literature, the title. Here's a sampling from his bibliography. Shotgun Gravy. Beyond Dinocalypse. Revenge of the Pen Monkey. Dogman and Catbird. If evocative juxtapositions like those don't set your heart pitter-pat and make you reach for your audible credits, I'm sorry, there's something dead inside. Underneath all the fine wrapping paper, there is the actual present. Strong female protagonists, a carefully pragmatic approach to existential questions, and, favorite, a willingness to turn genre conventions on their ears. Aside from horror, speculative fiction favors urban settings, so of course Wendig goes old school in Under the Empyrean Sky and the Atlanta Brave novels. Hand him the walking dead craze and he asks, what would happen to the other undead caught up in the zombie apocalypse? That's not just clever, it's useful. So, preach on, my brother. I will keep my Audible account full. And my stakes sharp. Yeah. yeah. Whoa, uh -huh. that was yeah. weird. Mind link. That's okay. So I like personally, Mr. Pointy there at the end. I, I go for more of a Mr. Stabby myself. Oh, is that yours? Yeah, you your that's own? one. Yeah, Mr. in my, my stabby holster. A little ang angrier. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit angrier. Right. Well, we've brought in extra staff just to operate our bank of bleep buttons. Ladies and gentlemen, we are thrilled to have <laughs> Chuck Wendig with us. <laughs> Chuck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Hi. Thank you for having me. <laughs> no, we're, we were saying before, I mean, you can swear as much as you want on the show. It just depends on how much you hate our editor. Nice. So you have about five minutes to just hold the beep button down. <laughs> yeah. I can get going. <laughs> so, Chuck, tell, right. tell us about the cormorant. The Cormorant. Uh, Miriam Black is back. Uh, Miriam Black is my uh, favorite psychotic psychic. She's a cantankerous, um, unpleasant person who can see how you're going to die by touching you. She heads down to Florida to uh, uh, a guy pays her to tell uh, him how she's going, how he's going to die. And what she finds in that vision is not only is he murdered, but the murderer is leaving her a vision 
uh, through time and in blood. And so she's kind of caught up in this game of vengeance. So that's a new thing for her? She doesn't usually experience the, 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 the time messages? Uh, not someone leaving a message for her in the death. That's a new one. Someone knows her power and is using it against her. Hmm. She's really frustrated, I, I, I get. You know, yeah. she just wants to get back to her life. She's not a happy camper. <laughs> no. 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 Well, you work in so many different types of media. Uh, you're, you do screenwriting, comics, novels. Is there, I, I imagine there's not one you enjoy most, like a favorite son, but what do you like about one versus the other? Uh, I always wanted to be a novelist just because I, you know, sort of, we would go to the beach and I would sit on the beach reading a book and everyone else was playing in sand and water. And I was like, shut up, I'm reading Lloyd Alexander. Uh, so novelist was always kind of my bag. Um, but there's something freeing about screenwriting because I don't really, I didn't really want to do it. So I don't care that much. So it's a lot more fun to just sort of do my own thing there. So when you say you didn't really want to do it, how did you end up doing it? Yeah, I, I, there was a, a, a mentorship um, available for a contest, a screenwriting contest. And at the time I was writing Blackbirds, the first Miriam Black book. And I was unable to finish that book for like four years. And so I decided I'm going to cheat and I'm going to try to win this screenwriting contest uh, because the, the mentorship was with a guy named Stephen Susco. He wrote The Grudge, The Grudge 2, um, Jack Ketchum's Red. His specialty is adaptations. And so I thought, well, I'm going to adapt this awful, crappy piece of <laughs> novel uh, over to um, a screenplay so I could figure it out because it's like one big outline. And then I would reroute it back to a novel. Uh, so I cheated totally. And then I actually turned out I liked it. So gotcha. I stayed for a while. So will the series end when you run out of birds that are black? No, actually, because um, Mockingbird is not a black bird. The second. Oh, okay. So I have all the birds. I can go titmouse. I can go booby nuthatch. Uh -huh. <laughs> I have a lot of birds. There's so, a theme, but yeah. yeah. Poop pants. Different, different genre with titmouse, I would imagine. Different genre. Yeah, a little, little, yeah. Some Both changes. genre and genera. And ge <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> We have some listener questions. Sorry, sometimes Tom's puns just like they, they hit the, the punny bone. I like them. Mostly not. Yeah, sometimes. mostly not, but sometimes. Um, our first question comes from Kevin. Uh, he wants to know, uh, please explain how taco and coffee binges lead to writing binges. Coffee binges, um, you know, it's like that thing in Re uh, Requiem for a Dream where the, the pupil dilates and, you know, all the, the words go into my brain. Um, taco binges do not help the writing. They just, I just basically sleep with taco binges. Coffee binges wake me up. They're like the accelerator pedal. Taco binges bring me down. They're like the brake pedal. So You're, it's like a speedball. Speedball. Right? Speedball. speedball. Okay. Right. Taco coffee. Yeah, it's the new. It's the new speedball. <laughs> the new millennium. They're gonna get YouTube comments being like, "That's not what a speedball is." For <laughs> do you? What kind of tacos do you have in your area? You're in Pennsylvania, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, we we have all the tacos. There's a great um Oaxacan place actually that does uh, really great uh great authentic tacos. They're new, new to us. I uh, got a question here from Feral Bulb, uh, who wants to know how much coffee you go through in 24 hours and also how much whiskey. And we promise that not all the questions are about coffee. And We're getting them out of the way yeah. early. I can answer those if they're all about that. Uh, I, you know, I drink two good-sized cups of coffee a day, and I do not drink uh, much whiskey in a day, if any. It's we, Whiskey is kind of a weekly habit, not a daily habit. Got it. That's probably healthier. Any, yeah, I have any personal so. favorites? Of the whiskey? Yeah. Right now I'm enjoying the Balvany uh, Doublewood. Mm. 12 what, year. How old? 12 years. Uh, it's 12. 12? I, I, 12? I, I that want the 15. It's, it's available at our... Pennsylvania has weird, weird liquor laws, mm. and they only have certain things available, so I have to sort of wrangle to get the whiskey. Is That's it a good. Sunday thing over there, too? Do you not have booze They're on They're now Sunday? open on Sundays. Okay, that changed but, the blue laws? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah Pennsylvania owns all the, the state stores, so they, they're the only orderer, if that is a word, of whiskey. Gotcha. So whatever they carry is whatever they carry. I, I'm from Connecticut, and we used to have to drive up into New Hampshire if we wanted to buy alcohol on on Sunday, which sounds really desperate when I put it that way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what are you trying to say? Our next question comes from Caleb. He says, based on the amount of novels you've recently published, I think it's safe to ask, do you ever have writer's block? Um, and if so, how do you deal with it? Uh, I don't have writer's block so much as I have a mortgage, uh, and that pretty much takes care of the writer's block. It's a good impetus, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It just dissolves yeah. it. Right yeah, there. I like having a roof. It's pretty cool. Uh, we got another question here from Kevin. It says, I enjoyed the blog post featuring a do-it-yourself profanity generator, but might there be any possibility of programming a Wendig profanity generator app so that yeah. we can use our mobile phones to create new and exciting ways to curse people while we are driving? 
Uh, call me, programmers. Um, you know, my, my app would be, I would make it with a crayon and a, uh, an iPhone box, not an actual iPhone. So I have literally no programming skills. So okay. someone wants to, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, help me figure that out. So sure. in other words, you are in development. I mean development, yeah. yeah. Deep, deep development. So what is, what is exactly a profanity generator? Are you inventing new profane words? Phrasing more than words. Phrasing, like It's okay. like you roll uh, either a, a die 20 or you use a random number generator to create new sentences and phrases um, of profane delight. I mean, and profanity is like a circus of language. So I just think there's a trapeze guy and the elephant's eating him and then the lion's killing somebody. It's good times. Infinite diversity. Yeah. An infinite, infinite combination. <laughs> Our next question comes from Alex. Uh, he wants to know, uh, what is it like working on serialized fiction as you do for Fireside Magazine? Do you have the whole thing already written out or do you kind of write as you go? This is my first real foray into serialized fiction. So um, I decided to kind of take a risk with it and not plan much. Uh, I'm now six episodes in and I have another six to go and I'm actually starting to do just a tiny scoosh, a scosh of, of planning, just a little. Uh, Richard wants to know, can I give birth to your half-feral Cthulhu children? Also, why did you choose the cormorant as the bird for your latest book? Obviously, really. I like the also. Yeah. Now, also. also. <laughs> By the way, side note. <laughs> and in a related um, question. I guess I can always use more babies. I'm sure there's something I can use them for. Like Especially half-feral Cthulhu half babies. Right. Yeah. They could protect me in some way. Uh, the cormorant uh, in the book not only does an actual cormorant um, figure into the, the plot, but uh, the a cormorant is a fishing bird, um, and so it's sort of a, a Miriam has to go, let's say, metaphorically fishing for a lot of interesting details uh, and plot points in the book. And then Catherine asks, do you plan on writing any more stories in the uh, Blue Blazes universe? Yes, actually, I'm writing the second book now. It is called The Hell's Blood Bride. Um, it should be out by the end of this year, I think. Nice. Maybe. And what's, what's that series about? Uh, it's, I combine the criminal underworld and the mythic monstrous underworld and sort of smash them together. And in the center of that, in the nexus is Mookie Pearl. Uh, he's a big, dumb, meat eating, uh, uh, thug loser, really, uh, who gets caught up in a, a plot to sort of bring the, the real underworld into the streets of New York City. So do you mean like, like mafioso kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, gangs, uh, old girl gangs from like the fifties, that kind of style. Oh, nice. Ro like roller state gang. It's cool. Like roller derby Pink gangs? Ladies. Yeah, roller derby gangs. Is that, the Get'em Girls, I actually have a whole roller derby thing in there. Oh, neat. Fantastic. Yeah. That's cool. Got a question here from Ele Electric, and you were mentioning 20-sided die er, earlier. Uh, did you do much fantasy or sci-fi gaming? And if so, why do you think those experiences didn't sink in as deeply as maybe the urban horror ones seem to have? Uh, yeah, I, I did. I Sure, I played D&D &D and uh, so forth back then. Um, it, it did sink in, and I, I, you know, I carry it. I want to write everything, so I don't feel like I'm uh, well, I think some of my more popular books are urban horror. Um, you know, I do have my uh, young adult series, Under the Imperian Sky, uh, which is pretty sci-fi. Um, it's kind of a side fantasy. It's like a kind of a, I think one of the blurbs describes it as Star Wars meets um, like a John Steinbeck novel. Uh, so, Well, and I think so, what Electric wants to know is, having written for the urban horror tabletop game Hunter the Reckoning, have you thought about writing for genres that are more common in gaming in the sci-fi fantasy realm? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I have, I've never done any sort of um, sword and sorcery epic fantasy stuff, though I want to. Uh, I kind of want to write everything. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I have dabbled in science fiction uh, outside of horror. Why do you think some people, and this is kind of a general question, why do you think some people tend towards certain genres? I, I know it sounds kind of like a really random, broad question, but I mean, we interview so many authors and they tend to very often kind of stay in their own genre universe. Um, why don't you think more people branch out? Uh, in terms of the authors branching out? Yeah. Uh, it's a lot safer to not do that. Um, uh, you know, your goal is to end up on a bookshelf, and bookshelves have to be labeled with a certain genre. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't neatly fit under that little label, they don't know where to put you, and you may not end up on the shelf. Um, gotcha. So, you know, Miriam Black books, they get labeled as urban fantasy, but they're kind of horror and they're kind of crime. So uh, nobody really knows what to do with them. I mean, they found an audience, so I'm not. Uh, complaining. And I think the internet age has actually reduced some of that worry, um, but bookstores still care. Well, and having worked in a bookstore, I mean, you know, Stephen King's a great example where you shelve yep. him in horror, but he right. doesn't always write horror. No, no, it hardly does, doesn't matter. Really. Yeah, yeah, you just yeah. shelve him there anyway. Shelve him there. Yeah. Now, you have a lot of experience kind of putting yourself out there um, online and in social media. And Sasha wants to know how else can writers start getting known besides writing a blog and reading and writing to get better on the sidelines? 
uh, it's like, you know, with anything, talk to people, um, put the best version of yourself out there, um, get on Twitter and talk to people and be cool about it and go to conferences and conventions and talk to people. Um, you know, as much as writing is a very isolated thing, you know, at the time of creation, this sort of story gestation is just you and the story. But then once you're done, it's a whole, it's a game of other people, um, editors and other writers and uh, agents. And even in the self-publishing side of things, it's uh, you interfacing with readers um, and cover artists. So it's it's a it's a game of people. So it's, it's all soil and green. And that kind of relates to Steve's question here, who points out you have one of the strongest online social networking presences among authors. He wants to know a little oh. bit about how that has, at least he thinks, I agree, well, thank uh, you. How, how that has helped you, but also anything related to your social media presence that has caused issues that maybe other authors should know about if they're trying to build up that kind of presence. Uh, you know, no, I, I kind of put it all out there. Maybe that's sometimes to a detriment, but I, I think at the very least it's very honest. And people respond to that. And that's, you know, sometimes it's, you know, talking about crazy toddler stuff at three o'clock in the morning or, um, you know, writer troubles. And I mean, the whole blog experience, everything I do in the blog, people always think I'm trying to um, create some writing advice empire. At the end of the day, I'm really just yelling at me about writing stuff. Or sometimes I'm writing about <laughs> like an 18 year old version of myself. And I'm like, I want to choke him and, and stop him from doing all of the stupid things he's going to do. And time travel story. Right. Yeah, and time travel story. There it is. <laughs> Like. That actually leads well into Nick's question. He wants to know kind of about like, what was the volume of rejection letters you got when you first started? And how do people kind of overcome that that initial setback of, you know, you're a first time writer, like the, the stuff you're writing might not be that great, or, or even if it's fantastic, and you're just hitting a lot of walls as you're trying to get published? Uh, yeah, I did get uh, some pretty rough uh, rejections. There was a um I, I wish I had it still, but I got a rejection from another, uh, there was a writer, Thomas uh, Monteleone, I think his name was. And uh, um, he did a column in like Cemetery Dance Magazine called like the Mothers and Fathers Association or something like that. Well, he was an editor for various magazines and he wrote me like the nastiest, screw you, you need to quit. You shouldn't be doing this, go home. Why did you send me this story? Kind of, it was that kind of rejection. It was like that soul crushing, like everything about me was like a little paper cup under a heavy boot. Uh, so that was hard, but you know, with rejection, what I, I usually tell people is it's like, you got to kind of embrace that Viking mythos, that idea that it's like scars are proving that you're out there fighting the fight as opposed to sitting at home doing nothing. Um, so rejection letters are like, I mean, they're armor, you know, they're proof that you're doing stuff. They're scars, uh, and battle scars showing that you're uh, doing this thing that you want to do. Oh, and Nick, um, Nick also wants to have your babies. Sure. So that's, that's number two. two. So, number many, two. so many do. Um, on the show. He said if he was a woman, if he were uh, a woman, he'd have your babies. Or at least well, what? Uterus. Yeah. Can we, I mean, what? A, can we still make it work? I mean, really, that's a lot less interesting, yeah. I think, now, the if I were a woman part. I think yeah, really, I he should just want to have your babies <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Let's just, genre bend it. Let's mix it. Yeah. Overcome and, yeah. and, and, and well, no. That's, genre bending. We didn't yeah, say gender bending. We said genre, genre bending. Genre bending. It's different. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, it's time for the super questions. Super questions. Uh, uh -oh. These are two questions that we kind of rotate around. Sometimes we ask authors the same ones. Uh, we think they're super. We hope you do too. <laughs> Question number one. What is your favorite word? Oh, uh, my favorite word. Um, you know, I like sesquipedalian. Ooh. Because it's a very long word that means very long word. It's the stupidest, most needless word, but I love it. What is the word for a word being the thing? Is it like onomatopoeia for words? Like the yeah, word there has being to be a word, right? For it's that. probably German. It's probably German. They always are, aren't they? They yeah. always are. Yeah. My it's favorite German. word is susurrus. I just found that out oh. earlier today. Did you? Actually. I mean, Did you, I tell you that? I used it and you're like, that's my favorite word. Oh yeah, I guess that's true. I, guess I, I had, a, I had a, a grade school teacher tell me that that was not a real word. What? Yeah, that and rictus. She was like, those are not real words. Like, that, oh, okay. What's a real word? Was she word? your English teacher? I know. Yeah, she was my yes. eighth grade English. Uh -huh. And I got out my like my old Stephen King and Robert McCammon horror books. I'm like, look, he uses them, lady. Yeah. <laughs> so like, English is a living language. I know. Whatever. LOL. Yeah, LOM. selfie. How about selfie, selfie. lady? That's right. It's in like, the dictionary. That's old English. <laughs> is, is it? <laughs> Yeah, no. No, you just made when me believe that, that like instantly. Like that was yeah. so like so fast I instantly believed someone for a second. When like that's up real L F Y E or something. So, when the so selfie okay. shooter, that's from Chaucer. You know, yeah, Chaucer. Chaucer. Yeah. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So our second super question. What are your top three reads? You can give us just one if you can't think of three. Uh top three reads like overall forever and ever. Yeah, yeah sure. sure. Um 
I'll go with uh, Swan Song by Robert McCammon, which is just like epic, crazy, apocalyptic horror, like fed into that 1980s era nuclear fear that all of us were raised on. Um, I just read uh, last year uh, The Shining Girls uh, by Lauren Bugis, which is an amazing, affecting, powerful, time-traveling serial killer novel. I heard great things about that book. Uh, So good. So good. And a shameless plug, actually, I have an interview with her in the paperback release of that book. Oh, cool. Nice. Yay. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And uh, I am a fan of, I'll, I'll pimp a friend because I like my friends. Friends are good people. Uh, Adam Christopher, his new book, Hangwire, comes out with uh, Angry Robot Books, um, another publisher of mine. And it is, uh, it's kind of a night circusy sort of, it's just good. You, you, you want it. When you, when you pimp it. your friend, you're pimping our friend because we, he let us uh, premiere his cover art for Hangwire. Nice. A while yes. So nice. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah that. Adam that was a good show. Fans. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Well, Chuck, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Uh, Chuck's latest book, The Cormorant, came out December 29th, so you better have bought it. You were going to swear. Go buy it now. You better f- bought it. it. That's it, folks. If you want more Sword and Laser, there's lots. You can join our Goodreads group at goodreads.com. And of course. Uh, and of course. And of now, course. And now of you see you're trying to curse. You're just making up words. And a freaking course. That's, I was combining. I was making up a word. I was doing that thing that we were talking about. It's living earlier. language. Yeah. Living language. And subscribe to the podcast, both audio and video, at swordandlaser.com. We'll see you next time. Bye, buddy. Bye. Lem, hey Lem, can you get the lights?